This song came originally from uh, an incident that happened to um, a married couple that I was working with. Uh, they were leading the team I was on. I was in my early 20s. And uh, one day I was staying at their house and she lost her engagement ring. And if a woman loses her engagement, engagement ring, it is like the world has come to an end, you know? It is like the apocalypse, you know, coming up, up, up on them. And, uh, and they searched high and low, and, and um, uh, eventually the ring was found, and there was great relief all around. Um, but the, the thing was that this engagement ring had never been very valuable in the first place, because when they got married, they, when they got engaged, they didn't have very much money. But there was a value to this ring way beyond. You know, if somebody said, I've got your ring, I'm holding it hostage, you have to pay me, you know, 50 times its actual value, she probably would have paid it, you know, because she put a value upon that ring because of what it meant to her. And so I, I turned that into a song. Uh, asking that, that question. Do we have the words for that or not? Do we? No? How much do you think you're worth? It may not be there, so don't mind. Not there, okay. That's right. Is a rich man worth more than a poor man? A stranger worth less than a friend? Is a baby worth more than an old man? Your beginning worth more than your end? Is a president worth more than his assassin? Does your value decrease with your crime? Like when Christ took the place of Barabbas, would you say he was wasting his time? Well, how much do you think you are worth, boy? Will anyone stand up and say, Would you say that a man is worth nothing till someone is willing to pay? Well, I suppose that you think that you matter. Well, how much do you matter to who? It's much easier at night when with friends and bright lights than much later alone in your room. Do you think they'll miss one in a billion when you finish this old human race? Does it really make much of a difference when your friends have forgotten your face? your life had been valued that a price had been paid on the nail would you ask what was traded how much and who paid it who was he and what was his name if you heard that his name was called Jesus would you say that the price was too What it cost him, you say no, but the price stays the same. If it don't make you cry, laugh it off, pass it by. But just remember the day when you throw it away, that he paid what he thought you were worth. Well, how much do you? 
Will anyone stand up and say, Tell me what are you willing to give him in return for the price that he pays? Ah, so Obviously, that, that song is, is uh, it's not a congregation worship song. It's a song to sing to people. And I often used to sing that kind of song uh, in a school uh, classroom and get a discussion going. What are you worth, you know? What are you worth from a material point of view? You know, you're 70% water. How much is that worth, you know? And there's a bit of, you know, uh, a few teeth and, you know, a few chemicals and... We could sort of uh, sell your blood or something, you know, but what, what are you worth? And of course, bring it around to that God has made the once and for all time statement about the value of each of us. And he did that by sending his son to die on the cross. So when I was on this team, I mentioned to you about... Um, we'd often sing some of the popular worship songs of the day. And I hadn't really written uh, those kind of songs. Uh, but one day, we started having some problems. It wasn't just one day, it was lots of days. Uh, we started to have some relationship problems in the team. There was about 10 of us working intense, long hours, you know, getting stressed and um, pressured and um, all young and full of our own ideas and thinking, I must be the one who's right. You know? <laughs> and so we'd often, people would sort of have little arguments and fall out with each other. I'm sure that never happens here. Because you're obviously perfect, as I can see. Uh, but I remember one occasion when we just sit around the circle, it was time for a prayer meeting, and it was just silence. Nobody felt they could pray because there was this kind of atmosphere, you know? Because people were holding resentment in their hearts. And, and in the middle of that, I thought, oh, what can I do about this? And I, I, out of a kind of prayer, I formed a prayer song. So I came back to the team and I said, look, um, we are struggling a bit with our relationships, but I've written this song and can you, you know, listen and maybe we can sing it together and, and maybe it'll, it'll help us. So it went like this, called Jesus Stand Among Us. Jesus. Jesus, stand among us at the meeting of our lives. Be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our lives. Oh, Jesus, we love you. So we gather here. Join our hearts in unity and take away our And um, that was all it was at first. Um, there was a couple of other verses. And uh, so, yeah, we, we, we sang the song together. And it really helped us to direct what, ourselves to, to Jesus, who was with us, and to why we were there, you know, in the first place. And so there was a bit of reconciliation and people shaking hands or a few tears. And, and so the atmosphere cleared. And a song helped to do that. And now and again, as we traveled around, we'd be in a church, and uh, one of the team will come up to me and says, they've got a few relational issues here. You know, people have, a few people have fallen out with each other. You better sing that Jesus Stand Among Us song, you know? <laughs> and all will be well. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and so I would do that, and then the song began to get passed around. These were the days, obviously, long before internet, there weren't even songbooks of these kind of songs. They were just people like me writing songs, and they get passed around on bits of paper, and, and uh, people would... Uh, and the overhead projector. You know the overhead projector? Not this lovely, sophisticated, computerized thing, but, you know, that sort of box with a lens over it, and you just write out on a sheet of, of you know, clear plastic put it on there, and suddenly, bang, the words are on the wall or the screen, if you're lucky, you know? 
Uh, and so suddenly, somebody could write a song uh, and people, you could instantly have the words because before that it was hymn books and the hymn books got revised every 25 years. So if you have a hymn book, that was it for the next 25 years. No new songs. Uh, well, of course, people started to print out their own illegally and so on. But anyway, we won't go into that. So songs got around and it soon became became evident that I, I should really try to adapt my singer-songwriter gifts to writing songs for the church. And I began to learn things like, well, I might be able to sing, we don't know, not very well though. And I might be able to sing way up, I, oh. I'm a baritone really, so I do struggle with those notes. But if you've got a crowd of people, they can't all sing the low of And you have to find that range where, and particularly most churches, men and women sing unison. So you suddenly, ooh, yes, you're down to this narrow range uh, um, where we, we want to all sing together. And I began to learn by trial and error uh, the kind of song that I could ask a congregation to sing. And I also recognized that the kind of words I used had to be uh, kind of all-embracing words. They had to be uh, things that we could all sing together. If I'm singing my own song, that's fine. I can sing my perspective and my, you know, view on things. And people will sit there and think, well, yeah, that's, that's what he thinks. I don't necessarily agree. But uh, that's fair enough. That's his experience. But if I was to take that personal song and say, now we're all going to sing it, uh, it would be quite reasonable for people to say, people, people to say actually, um, this, this song isn't my experience, so I can't really sing it honestly, you know? Um, uh, or, oh, I'm not sure I agree with that, you know? Um, uh, and etc. Do you see what I mean? The, 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 once you want the church to sing a song, you enter into a realm which I've heard described as public truth. Okay, I was talking this morning about revelation and response. And uh, uh, the revelation is the public truth. It's like we as the church, in our uh, church, our denomination, our network, these are the truths that we all uh, affirm. We agree to these things. And so uh, we're going to make sure that what we sing is true to, to, to that. And... Uh, that's where we have to start being discerning about what we ask everybody to sing as opposed to just what a soloist might, might, uh, might sing. Anyway. But of course, personal experience, um, when God is at work in us, it's the same Holy Spirit. So when an individual goes through uh, a journey of learning, um, and if they're being taught by the Holy Spirit, then those lessons are very likely to be appropriate to everybody. So I'm going to sing you a song that, that um, I wrote with a young man uh, a couple of years ago. And the experience was actually his. He'd, he was a very good musician, but he'd just sort of got a few ideas, very good ideas, but he just had like almost a poem. It wasn't a full lyric of a song. And um, uh, so we, we met up and he, he played me his song and I looked at it and I thought, I think I can help you shape this into a complete song, you know? Um, it's a song called Holy Overshadowing. So if we can have that uh, up on the screen. He'd been through some big difficulties in the context of his family and he was starting to express the lessons which he really felt that God was teaching him um, in the midst of, of that. Um, now, for me, it was that um, phrase, holy overshadowing, which attracted me. Uh, he just had it come once, uh, but I thought, that is such a poetic phrase, holy overshadowing. It's quite a singable, holy overshadowing. There's a kind of a inner poetry to it. And um, so I, I pointed that, that out and I said, I said, Ben, I really think we've got a great song here and we need to 
call it holy overshadowing, and we need to structure the song such that we keep landing on that phrase, holy overshadowing. Uh, and then we expand the ideas that you've started into a journey through the verses. So this is how it came up. Steve knows this one, so he can accompany me. It's fantastic. <laughs> Spread your wings of mercy over me And guard my heart with true humility No shadow of the darkness pressing in Only the holy overshadowing Under Until these troubles pass, my heart will sing. Praise for the holy overshadow underneath your wings. Overshadow. Try singing the chorus, you are my shield.
In fact, just keep those words up there because um, now I know, I'm, I know not all of you are, uh, are songwriters or necessarily will, will be, but um, you all will be or are and probably the rest of your lives, you will be song choosers. You'll be very influential in choosing the songs that are sung. So it's good to think about songs, and I'm sure you already have some great teaching on this already, um, uh, so that you can look at a song and you can, uh, in a very positive way, you can critique it and say, what is it that makes this song really work well? Or why isn't this song really working so well? You know, um, and one of the things which is so important is is what's called prosody. Prosody that is that is the way in which every element works together and supports every other element. So, in particular, melody and lyric. You know, so in that chorus, uh, you are the lifter of my head. So it talks about your head being lifted up, and the melody goes, da, 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 da. Uh, if I'd have put the words, um, to you I will bow down, bow down, you are my shoe and my glory, and to you I will bow down. Mm. No, bowing down is a, <laughs> melody has to go down, you know. Um, just some obvious uh, kind of things. But also, um, behind a lyric like that, now that lyric didn't come quickly. It was crafted over quite a long period of time, probably from the first time I sat down with uh, Ben and um, he played me his raw idea and showed me his lyric. It was at least six months before we kind of finally signed off on this song. And that was only just emailing backwards and forwards and I'd spend a couple of hours on it and I'd send it to him and say uh, what do you think about this uh, we need a, f a whole new first verse written you know and he'd write back and say yeah I like you know the third line but somehow it's, it's not really um, the opening line is not quite right and all these sorts so I'd try another one and, and he'd try some and I'd send it back and bit, little by little uh, we finally arrived at something which we thought, yes, that is really special, you know. And in the midst of all of that, of course, uh, I'm looking at the Bible. I'm looking at, because this, this imagery of the overshadowing wings is very present in the Psalms in particular. Psalm 63, Psalm 91 and elsewhere. Um, and also, I noticed that there was another place where they're overshadowing wings, and that is in the in the, uh, over the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies of the, of the tabernacle uh, where the blood was sprinkled um, for the, to atone for sins and, and the, the, they had these um, cherubim with their wings outspread over the mercy seat so that's another picture of mercy and that's where, can I just have verse 2 it starts with no refuge what I seek and that's where that, that line, only the cross, the blood to wash my sin, came from. No refuge will I seek but God alone. No hiding place, save only at your throne. Only the cross, the blood to wash my sin. And that really came out of studying all these references to the overshadowing and the wings you know, of God um, in the scriptures. And um, so as a lyricist, if I'm writing for the church, I want to draw in as many biblical references as I can, as long as they can be presented in, in such a way that's poetic um, and flows and it's singable. And that line, you know, only the cross, the blood to wash my sin, there's, a, there's an inner rhyme in that, isn't there? Only the cross, the blood to wash my sin, you know? Um, within the line itself, there are rhymes and vowel sounds that Sit together. Okay. I think a really important thing to think about, um, and I'm sure many ways you do. So, I mean, I'm a stranger to you, so I don't know what kind of things that you uh, 
you commonly study and think about. But one of the things when I started to study uh, worship from the scriptures, uh, first of all, I just copied everyone else, right? It was a new thing to stand up with a guitar and lead worship. And so I, I just did what I did, and I also copied other people what they did. And there came a point where I thought, actually, I don't really know why I do what I do from a biblical point of view. I know from a practical point of view. So I decided to make a study, and I spent some time uh, studying the scriptures and trying to understand about um, worship and what it, uh, uh, what it really is, um, is, is all about. And one of the things that really struck me was that worshiping God has a great deal to do with how we treat other people. Hmm? Jesus said, um, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled and then come back. Wow. Wow. So you can't, you, God doesn't really want you to worship until you've made peace. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because we were, you know, it's all about who we're worshiping. Uh, the God who has reconciled us to himself in Christ and who has made peace so that we can be at peace with one another. He's broken down all the dividing walls. So if we think that we can just bound into God's presence and sing some jolly songs when in reality we, are, uh, we have anger or we have unforgiveness in our hearts towards other people or resentment or whatever, forget it. God's not interested in hearing your songs. There is in fact, um, and again, it's, it's very well known, so... Um, sure you would have come across it before, but uh, in Amos, the prophet Amos, uh, the, the uh, prophet Amos speaks from God to uh, the nation of Israel who are uh, apparently having great festivals and you know, they gather together, probably at Jerusalem, and they'd sing their songs, and, and they'd have a great festival. And so God says through Amos the prophet, away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. What's, what's the problem? Is it bad music? It's probably very good music. But if you read the context of Amos... And if you look at what follows on from that statement, there's a but. You know, away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. And that wasn't addressing um, just personal morality. It was, you can see it all there in the book of Amos. It's all about how people... We're treating one another, exploiting one another, and um, making, taking advantage of one another, and uh, using the law to persecute, or to, to take advantage of, of people who are in a weak position. All that sort of stuff. Why? It's all there. And uh, as far as God is concerned, it becomes a stench because there was no justice in their lives. In the early teachings that I heard about uh, worship, um, often uh, that Hebrews passage about uh, the fruit of our lips, um, bringing the fruit of our lips, giving praise to God. And we say, yes, come on, we've got to express our worship. And I, I would naturally think about songs but then that same scripture goes straight on uh, to say, uh, and do not neglect to do good and to share what you have with others because with such sacrifices, God is pleased. 